morning, everybody. How are you today? I know it's the middle of the week and uh, everybody's busy, huh? But still, I think you're busy writing response and reports. I think last class was interesting or boring or both. So let's see somebody who did not attend the class. Is it difficult to report? You watch the class. Good. So, uh, yes, please come here. The suit season of spring swept the region, Obama said, from Tunisia to Egypt to Libya, to Libya, and Bashar's about to end. The swift swallow pursued the dictators. Winter is worn to a spectrum of rebirth. Palestine is being reborn, Abbas's words rung, but for my unfortunate land, only sorrow sprung. Not that I mind a veto from a snake, for their hypocrisy is revealed, and my struggle, and my struggle is never to shake. <clears throat> well, thank you. I think we should clap for her. Uh, I like this report. Yes, she did not attend the class, but she had a chance to watch the video of that class, and this is like an advantage of having the, this class running like this. Good. Uh, I need another report, and this time uh, I should choose one. Yes. At the lecture, I sat in my chair, but I didn't uh, prepare. My teacher pointed at me to read that re my report. I hadn't uh, prepared yet, but I forced it to read it. My face was sorted, but I tried to hide it. My reading was so fast because of my fright. After my reading in the class, I sat with a relax. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think everybody is turning into a poet in this class. But let us uh, remind ourselves like, of the things we did in the class uh, last time. I think we uh, talk about our initial response. And uh, we just like talked about certain aesthetic elements of the poem uh, in general. Today we're going like uh, to paraphrase, to come close to the poem, you know, and to see how uh, like the poem is beautiful. Uh, last time we agreed uh, that, uh, if you remember, We agreed that the poem uh, had a wonderful description of spring, and uh, most of you like thought that uh, you know the, uh, you know the description was wonderful because of the images, because of uh, I mean the uh, figures of speech, uh, because of the music, because of the sound. So let us be like today more like uh, closer to the poem itself. Uh, you see here the suit season that bud and the bloom forth brings, with the green hath clad the hill and eke the veil. The nightingale with feathers now she sings, the turtle to her make hath told her tale. Summer is come, for every spray now springs, the heart hath hung his own, his old head on the pain, the buck in break, his winter coat he flings, the fishes float with a new repaired scale, the other, all her slough away she slings, the swift swallow pursues the fly smell, the busy bee, her honey now she mings, winter is warm, that was the flowers made, and thus, and thus I see among these pleasant things, each care decays and yet my sorrow springs. I think it is, you could have, uh, or you could read it differently, but I just read it for demonstration. Uh, to paraphrase this poem is not to analyze it, you know, to uh, paraphrasing, I want you to understand that the paraphrasing of the poem is only one part of the meaning. So it is not, like we can paraphrase in order to comment. 
Uh, as you see here, like right from the very beginning, uh, the poet shows how strong the drive of life is in spring. You know, spring, as we said, is always associated with rebirth. And here, like, okay, the suit season is budding, you know, the season is budding. And here, of course, you have a metonymy. When we say the season, it means like budding. It is like uh, the whole spring is like a tree, which is budding. But we see that the season is like a person that is covering the whole vista with green color. See what I mean? So the season that bud and the bloom forth brings, with the green hath clad the hill and eke the veil. So right from the very beginning, uh, you know, the writer wants to show us that this beauty or, uh, you know, this revival is dominating the whole scene. And you see this personification of the spring itself, because the spring is like what? Like a man who is trying to cover, you know, with a green color. The nightingale with feathers, now she sings. Accordingly, you know, like, because it is a season of rebirth, so we expect that everything is going to be jovial, happy, you know? So it is not like the nightingale with feather, now she sings. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. The nightingale is happy and, uh, you know, singing the most mel melodious songs. The turtle to her make hath told her tale. Again, the turtle dove, like we have a male and a female, and, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, they are exchanging, you know, a uh, love relationship. The nightingale with feathers now, she sings, the turtle to her mate had told her tale. Uh, summer has come, so it's a declaration, like all the creatures are declaring that summer is, you know, coming. And summer in England is interchangeable with, uh, with uh, no, with the spring. So sometimes it is difficult to know which is summer and spring. So summer is equivalent to spring in England. Summer has come for every spray now springs. It is like every tree, every branch of a tree is springing, is sprouting. The heart has hung, his hold is all hid on the pale. The heart, you know, a male deer is, you know, I mean, in winter, usually, a lot of animals hibernate. You know what I mean, hibernate? Mm -hmm. Just they become dormant. They are not active. But when spring comes, they jo yeah. go and, like, you know, they are given a new life. And uh, they become very active. The buck, which is, you know, uh, again, a male deer or, you know, a rabbit, in break his winter coat, he flings. It's like rebirth. It's regeneration. Even the skin, everything is acquiring a new uh, garment. The fishes float with the new repair, like here you see, uh, it's not only the land, but it is also the sea. The other, the other, uh, you know, the snake, all her slough away she slings. You know, the other gets rid of the old uh, garment, it's called slough. And the swift swallow pursues, is flying from one, uh, you know, uh, uh, branch of a tree to another in order to uh, kill, uh, you know, uh, a fly. The busy bee, the busy bee, uh, I mean, the bees, of course, in summer, because, you know, like there are a lot of flowers, so bees are busy uh, going uh, to every flower to, to suck what? The nectar, not honey, you know, like before, uh, the nectar is being processed, it becomes up, you know. But again, I think you smell now. You started, did you start to smell? Like when you read this poem and, you know, I think you imagine and our senses are invoked, you know. And this is the beauty of uh, the poem because this poem is full of, uh, you know, sensual imagery. Like imagery that appeal to our senses. The busy bee 
her honey now she makes. It's, uh, you know, uh, the busy bee is like trying to collect nectar, very busy. Winter is warm, again, it is another declaration to show that everything has changed. Like winter is parallel to summer has come and winter is behind. No more hibernation, no more death. Everything now is given a new life. So it's a reminder that this is spring, this is a month of rebirth. Uh, winter is warm, that was the flowers bale. And then, you know, and thus I see among these pleasant things. Our poet, you know, is leaving this behind and he's talking about himself. And thus I see among these pleasant things, each care decays. Each care has come to an end. Yeah. My sorrow springs. I think we feel sorry for him. Yeah. He's very gentle, he's very polite. Yeah. Now, uh, let us approach uh, this poem, you know, uh, from a static point of view. Like, look, let's look at the rhyme, the red, you know, the figures of speech, yeah. the alliteration. Okay? So why is it beautiful? A lot of you say it's a beautiful. I like this description. Why? You know, how, like, if you look at, uh, you know, spring here, it is like when you read and, like, uh, employ, uh, you know, or imagine, so your senses are invoked, and then you imagine the whole scene, the whole scene is enacted. You know what's been enacted? It's brought to life by the virtue of our senses, because... You know, this is full of imagery. Look at the season, you know, itself, the color. It's a visual image which makes us imagine the whole vista uh, being green. The nightingale uh, with its melodious songs, the sound image is introduced. So we are, uh, you know, uh, given an image of a very lively scene of rebirth, okay? But why I noticed, like, in the first line, this suit season, okay, suit season, like, the S sound is, it's similar. We have this, you know? So it's very musical, the sound image, and this parallel with the bird, like the birds that are twittering, and say, you know? Like when I read it, I just imagine like this, you know, they are doing this. Uh, but what attracted my attention to the, you know, is the alliteration of bulb and the bloom and brings. Pop, 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 you know? Now the, these, this alliteration is associated with, you know, power, power, you know? And what does this mean? You know, what does this imply? Yes? It implies his suffering? No. No? Yes? It does change and the effort is dominating everything. Yes, that's better. Yeah, the change, the drive of a change is very powerful. You know, it is something which cannot be reversed. See what I mean? It is very powerful. The drive of life, the drive of regeneration is very powerful. When the green has clad the hill and eke the veil. So it is, we're talking about the hill and, you know, the valley. So the change is not limited to one place, but it is it's spreading. It is all over the the place, you know, it is panoramic change. Yes, the nightingale, uh, but look here, eek, we said like, it is uh, also, I think, you know, uh, in this poem, uh, like what you said last time, some of you were disturbed because the poet was using these archaic words. But as I mentioned, archaic words, have to do, uh, you know, have to do with this rustic flavor, like usually some poets embellish. I mean, mainly, uh, you know, uh, 16th century, like Howard himself, 
wanted to embellish poetry with you know some Latin references, uh, and I think in this poem, uh, like the word "save," yeah. is taken from yeah. Latin, uh, and you know this is old English, uh, not old English. I would say Chaucerian English. Chaucer was using the set of uh, sweet suit, you know, and he was using a eek, you know, a lot. So this is a kind of archaic English to give rustic flavor, and it would add beauty to the, you know, poetry itself. Uh, the nightingale with feathers, now she sings. It is, it is a festive atmosphere. Now, from the very beginning, this, you know, I mean, spring is everywhere, so now all the creatures are celebrating. So it's an atmosphere of festivity. It is an atmosphere of rebirth and creativity. The nightingale with feathers, now she sings. And this is, as you see, an image. What kind of image is this? Yeah, when you are like nightingale. It's sound and visual. It's a visual. And even what we call kinetic image. Kinetic because there is a movement. We, we imagine, we, we see, we listen like to the nightingale. So the nightingale is jovial. Why? Because it is, you know, this is the atmosphere of happiness. This is the atmosphere of celebration. The nightingale with feathers, now, you know, new she sings. The new feathers. You know? Like here we have this, what we call in botany, uh, you know, it is molting. Like, so everything is given. A new, uh, a new shape, uh, a new appearance, a new skin, a new garment. It's regeneration. The turtle to her make hath told her tale. Here, uh, you know, again, uh, we said last time, if you remember, uh, that our friend, I mean, uh, the poet, uh, was, you know, Nobel, and he was very polite, he was of noble birth, and this is like a kind of euphemism. Like, uh, he didn't want like to speak about things explicitly, you know? And we said this is like the, uh, you know, atmosphere of regeneration, it's, uh, you know, so multiplication is there, because everything is multiplying, everything is reproducing, summer has come, for every now, for every spray now springs. Summer has come. You know, again we are reminded that uh, of the advent of summer. You know, advent, the arrival of summer. Summer has come. For every spray now springs. Again, like the alliteration, uh, uh, you know, shows how, uh, you know, everything was shows how lovely the scene was by its sound. The heart hath hung his whole, his old head on the pale. Look hard. You know, it's like, you know, panting out because everybody is, oh my God, is taken by surprise. You know, yeah. it is, everybody is taken by the surprise by this advent and jovial, you know, scene. The heart has hung his old head on the pain. The buck, the brain, his winter coat he flings. I think, you know, all these are personifications. And we said, uh, what is a personification? It is like assigning, what is, yeah? Yeah, it's assigning features or characteristics of human beings or persons to yes. non-human beings. Yes, and uh, human beings. you're right. Now, so, this description is vivid by the virtue of imagery and by the virtue of personification. Because the whole picture is animate, animated for us. Why? Because we have a lot of, you know, uh, personifications. The fishes float with a new repaired scale. Again, you know, here we are. Uh, you know, the writer is like zooming somewhere else, zooming the river, the sea. 
So uh, he's reminding us that this change is entire, is comprehensive. It is not excluded to one area. The fishes float with a new repaired scale. The other, it's a reptile. So reptile, animals, birds, you know, uh, everything. The other, all her slough, away she slings. Imagine how uh, lovely, you know, the, I know it's a frightening image, uh, but still like there is something beautiful about, you know, the skin or the slough of a snake. The swift swallow, the swift swallow. It's a visual, kinetic, sound image. The swift swallow. Away she slings. The swift swallow pursues the fly's snail. It's, you know, this is how, uh, you know, regeneration happens. We have the image of life and death. So as you see here, you know, okay, regeneration means like some creatures feed on the other creatures. So it is life. The swift swallow pursues the fly, you know, and perhaps the uh, the swallow can be swallowed by what? By the uh, you know the other. So it is. This is nature. It's the cycle. The busy bee, her honey. Now she sings. It's an image of the busy bee, and we said this. Busy B, it is an example of onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia, you know, it shows how uh, vital and active, you know, the, the creatures are. The busy B, her honey now she means it's busy. Winter is warm, was the flowers bail. Winter is behind. It's another declaration reminding us this is everything has changed. And then suddenly, you know, we have the poet drawing attention to his own situation. And thus, and thus, I see among these pleasant things, these pleasant things, still like they are in front of him, not those. Each curve decays and yet my sorrow springs. I think this line, each care decays, each care comes to an end, yet my sorrow springs. Look here, the last line is broken. It's broken by the pose. And the pose is represented by, you know, the grammatical. There is like a new sentence. So there is a pose and a new sentence. And this is what we call in poetry, suzura. Suzura, it is a pose it is something, you know, in the middle of the line, it's a break. So it could be structural, it could be, you know, pose. And each care, so when we read it, we say, and each care decays. And like, there is a pose, and yet my soul springs. It's a paradox, isn't it? Yes. What is the paradox? paradox? Paradox and irony. The paradox is like, how, you know, because, uh, you know, like sorrow is springing. Sorrow is springing. We like spring uh, when something springs. You know, it is changing from you know to a better case. However, like this is you know aggravating. The sorrow is aggravating the springing. But as we said, here we have a wonderful technique. You know, in uh, stylistics, we call it the technique of, you know, juxtaposition. As you see, like juxtapose to put things, you know, uh, side by side. So what is being juxtaposed here? What is being juxtaposed? The spring and, and the sorrow of the poet. Yes, they are juxtaposed. Like, or spring, you know, and the situation of the poet. So this, you know, spring is a changing, spring like, you know, it's beautiful, and like the situation of the poet remains as it is, you know, and even it's getting worse because, you know, sorrow is springing, is increasing. So this, uh, you know, kind of juxtaposition 
spawns or generates the irony. You know what I mean? The irony? Now, the situation has become very ironical. How come? You know? How come? Like, everything is changing, and your situation remains the same. So here, we have a sense of irony. You know, like everything around the poet is a changing, you know, but his situation is not. Of course, all these, uh, you know, uh, as I told you, uh, we cannot discuss every single aesthetic element in every poem we are studying. Uh, but we, ha we can have some of these, and like you can uh, add something if you need to add. Now, this is, as we said, uh, you know, it is not Henry Howard who introduced this on it. Uh, you know, but it was Sir Thomas Wyatt. However, like, uh, we ha he developed this on it. And if you look here, you see that what kind of development he did. What kind of development? Uh, yes? The division of three quatrains. So, what do you mean by that? Okay. What, what do you mean by three quatrains? Like, the, yes, like we have three stanzas. Each stanza is made of four lines, and we have a couplet. So, uh, this is a kind of departure, a departure from the Petrarchian sonnet form. The Petrarchian was... Uh, Rigid little bit because you have the octave and the cystic. Here, as you see, A, you know, and here it is made uh, clear. A, you know, A, B, A, B, and then uh, C, uh, E, C, uh, or sorry, A, B, A, B. Uh, okay, sorry. Yes. It's escaping, huh? Yes. A, B. A, B. Uh, you know, S. A, B, A, B. A, B. So you have like three quatrains, you know, and, you know, uh, a couplet, uh, you know, you can say AA, or if you want to give it in your rhyme, you can say EE. So, like, we are having a more flexible form, a more flexible form. Henry Howard also, uh, you know, uh, this poem is written in iambic pentameter. And we said the iambic pentameter is very musical. So if you look at the <laughs> su, si, za, the bad, and lu, fourth brings, it is ti, tam, ti, tam. It should be like this, su, si, za, the bad, and lu, fourth brings. It's very musical. And I think this is apt for the scene itself. Uh, we mentioned, like, uh, in, uh, when we were doing the introduction, how iambic pentameter is very, so this is very systematic. He was fond of using the iambic pentameter, and even, like, he invented blank verse, and the blank verse was unrhymed, uh, you know, unrhymed uh, iambic pentameter. I don't want you to be disturbed, but look here, you just, like, look, with the green, it is unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. Like, the choice of this was like to show some musicality. Some writers might play with these, uh, you know, with the meter for some purposes. Here he's not playing, it is like he's presenting, you know, the whole in high bay pentameter. Okay? Now, let us go to the critical plan. And, uh, you know, I ask you to uh, prepare the critical plan. And in the critical plan, 
if you remember this part, we are warned, we are admonished not to be hasty. So, because, you know, I, I thought some, uh, some of you, when you read the scripture of spring, you jumped to this conclusion that, you know, this poem is about spring. And you fail uh, to read uh, the last couplet. Huh? Did it happen to you? Did it happen to you? Yeah, at the beginning, yeah, you, the poem is intriguing. You just look and you say, wow, this is a wonderful description of what? Of spring. And suddenly you ignore, like, uh, you know, certain line. In the critical plan, you are admonished, like the, the part I gave you. We should read the poem from the very beginning, you know, before uh, we uh, give a judgment or before we talk about, you know, the theme of the poem. We have to read the poem as a whole. And I think, you know, in the critical plan, I included for you this poem, which is the Lever uh, Leverer by, uh, you know, Graves. And uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, whether all of you have read this poem or not. Have you read this poem? Let us read this poem. Near Martin Puss, that night of hell, two men were struck by the same shell. Together, tumbling in one heap, senseless and limbless, like slaughtered sheep. One was pale, eighteen year old, blue eyed and thin and not too bold, pressed for the war, not, you know, ten years too soon, the shame and pity of his platoon. The other came from far off lands, with bristling chin and whisker hands. He had known death and hell before in Mexico and Ecuador. Yet in his death, this throat wild groaned, mother, mother, like a child. While the poor innocent in man's clothes died cursing God with brutal oath. Old surgeon Smith, kindest of men, wrote out two copies and then of his accustomed funeral speech to cheer the women folk of each. He died a hero's death and we, his comrades of a company, deeply regret his death. We shall all deeply miss so too proud. Okay. I know it's difficult. But like this poem was given to a class of poetry like you. And you know what? After reading this poem, they came to this hasty conclusion that in this poem, there is, uh, this poem is about two soldiers. One was, uh, you know, uh, courageous, bold, and the other was, you know, covered, uh, or, uh, you know, a coward, or cowardly. And what happened, like, in their death, their position was, you know, reversed. Uh, the one who was cowardly uh, became more daring, and the one who was daring, I mean the veteran, became cowardly. This is, you know, a hasty, Division. I mean, a hasty decision. And like those students who came to that conclusion have not read the poem aloud, have not looked at the final, you know, uh, two stanzas or the, the penultimate and the final stanza. Yes, they are two soldiers. They were tumbled by the same chill. You know, these students fail to see the irony. Uh, they uh, fail to, uh, you know, feel the sarcastic tone of the writer. Like, yes, they died. One was a hero, died as a hero, and one was, uh, sorry, one died as a hero, and the other died as a coward. But what did Sergeant, you know, Smith say about them? You know, what did he do? Old Sergeant Smith, kindest of men, wrote out two copies and then, wrote two copies. This for one of his accustomed speech. Like he was writing, you know, this is his way of writing speech. You know, when a soldier dies, yeah. uh, speeches and funerals and giving, you know, and, uh, memorials, uh, you know, just to speak uh, about like the person who died. To cheer, like what was the purpose? To cheer the women folk of each. So the purpose was sentimental. It was not genuine at all. 
And what did he say? Each one, he died a hero's death. You think each one died as a hero? Because one said, mother, mother, he was like a child. And the other said, oh God, and you know, he was cursing. This is what happened. So look here, is he true? Is he honest? Or is he a liar? He's a liar. He died a hero's death. And we all his comrades of a company. Look how he's a liar. Liar. Look how he is sentimental. You know what I mean? He wants us to cry. He wants uh, to force us to cry. We deeply regret his death. We shall all deeply miss so true pal. Very, you know, very a liar. Hypocrisy. So I think, you know, reading the two lines will make us change our mind about the whole poem. So we cannot say that this poem is about the reversal of, uh, you know, uh, the fortune of the two uh, soldiers. We cannot say. Who can tell me what is it about then? After reading. Like here, the story is clear. As you see, here, uh, he's like uh, assigning the place. It is a place, uh, you know, uh, Martin Puss, the night of hell. Uh, two men were struck by the same shell. It was a shell, artillery shell. Together, tumbling in one heap, senseless and limbless, without limbs, like slaughtered sheep. One was pale, 18, he's telling like about each one. One was pale, 18 year, and he was blue eyed, you know, uh, very, you know, handsome. And he was pressed when he was young to the war. And the other came, it was like veteran, experienced. He, came, he was fighting everywhere, like the soldiers of Gaddafi. Uh, they were brought from Africa, you know? So he was fighting everywhere. But when they died, this, you know, this one said, Mother, mother, he was like a child. You see? But you know what the surgeon said? That he was a hero. So now you come to understand that uh, this poem is about It is? It's about political hypocrisy. It's about the false idea of heroism. You know? Because sometimes, uh, you know, we exaggerate the achievement, you know, of some people. They are not heroes. They are not heroes. Uh, but we think that they are heroes. Okay. You see what I mean? So whenever you come, to, uh, or to give a general statement, you have to make sure to read the poem. This applies to our poem, you know, like a description of spring. Yeah. Uh, we don't have to be very yeah. hasty. We have to think deeply, you know. Uh, okay, as you see, we don't have to jump to this conclusion. This poem is lovely. I like it very much because it's about regeneration and rebirth. What about this? And thus I see among these pleasant things. Each care decays, and yet my sorrow spreads. So now, uh, of course, like the title, uh, reading this and reading the title would uh, make you come to this conclusion that this poem seems to be about courtly love. But we see here, like, He's a little bit different from our previous poet because he is less offensive. He's very polite. He's very gentle. He's not denigrating women. He is implying. And thus I see among these pleasant things each care decays, and yet my soul springs. You know? He just like won our hearts, won our compassion by this noble. He's very noble, huh? Okay, now, uh, you know, some of you might, I say it seems to be about courtly love. Because in the morning, you know, when I was reading this poem, I said, wait a minute. You know, it might not be about courtly love. It might be about, you know, the king's, you know, relationship with other courtiers. You know, 
uh, it could be about the court life. And because he was in prison, you know, he was, uh, you know, uh, like the, the king was angry with him all the time. So he was referring to the life you know, that of the court, everybody, everybody in the court was like having his place except him, you know. So this is, you know, another reading of the poem. He might be referring to his political or unsuccessful political career in, you know, the court of Henry VIII. Because Henry VIII, as I told you, uh, was, you know, very changeable, was very whimsical, eccentric, his behavior, he was not like, uh, he didn't like anybody to rival him, and this man, like, was a rival, that's why he was beheaded, and yeah. in fact, I wanted to show you today, like, the scene of his trial, uh, but in, uh, hopefully next time before we start, like, our next poem, I can show you this. Okay, uh, this is enough about the poem, but if you have any question, you know, uh, you can ask before that. Of course, now it is your responsibility to write. You know, to write, you know, yeah. you know a, I mean, a critical account of this. You can piece up together things we said in the lecture and bring them together. Okay? Uh, like you can write about the theme, you can write about the rhyme, the, you know, about the music, about this and that. Okay? About figurative uh, language in this poem. Okay? Any question? So, let me thank you. And uh, next time, hopefully, we're going uh, to see uh, another poem, which is, uh, I think, uh, no, Litany? Yeah, Litany. We're talking about Sir Philip Sidney. Sir Philip Sidney, uh, and uh, we will be like living also in the critical plan, uh, the same part. Thank you very much, and see you next time.